Hello and welcome to the lore you know. Once again Buddy. on Thursdays. Time it's a weird day. day changing, right? I'm always yeah. like, oh, it's Thursday. I can prep for the Lord. No, no, wait, that's today. Oh, no, no, today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I've, I've had to move my prep from uh, from basically Thursdays to Wednesdays, which right. is weird. Yeah. It's strangely weird. But but there you go. There you and go. today we're still on those scarred lands and we're talking about the Blood Sea. So carrying over from last week. So if you missed last week, we talked about the Toe Islands, which was the first little step off from the main continent up in that. Yeah, yeah, yeah that right, upper right hand corner. <laughs> Yeah. But this whole eastern side of the continent and goes out. in my window and right. out. You can't even. You probably can't even see it on Twitch. <laughs> but uh, goes goes out there. Why am I not seeing? I'm not seeing the chat on Twitch, so I'm gonna have to refresh. Um, yeah, it's it goes very very far and very uh, very oddly, and I'm going to complain grossly in a moment once once I can tell that you've put the map up there. <laughs> ah, the new map or the the old map, right? Yeah. Gotcha. So, so this this today's today's thing covers basically mostly one book, which is the Blood Sea, the Crimson Abyss, um, chapters uh, I think three and four, um, and that's from the original three five publication, chapter three, Heart of the Blood Sea, and no chapters, sorry, two and three, um, Beneath the Crimson Waves and the Heart of the Blood Sea. Um, and kind of, I guess, the Scarlet Deeps chapter one. We did chapter four last episode when we talked about the Toe Island, so I kind of doing the book in backward order. Yeah. Um, but um, not much from the three, from the five E, um, uh, Blood City Crimson Abyss, since that's mostly talking about the pirates. So we kind of already covered that. Um, and also a little bit of lore from the Wise and the Wicked, and um, and some of our own writings in the Stavellers. So, starting with this map, two things about canon scarred lore, canon, oh, three, three, five scarred lore that I would like to change. One is all of the dates in the Forsworn and Forsaken, which we have not talked about yet, and the other is this map. <laughs> and there's a lot of little snickety things I'd like to change, you know, like like there was an error here and this is confusing, and split. but in terms of big things, this map, <laughs> it's like... Makes no sense. And I'm about to explain why, and I will, bitch, I will try to keep my bitching about this map to a minimum, but it's hard for me to, because I'm so passionate about why I hate this map. So, cool things about this map is it shows uh, Termana and Gelspad in kind of how big they are in scale to each other. And this is accurate to multiple other publications. It's accurate to how, I think in the Gelspad, campaign setting book and how big it's supposed to be it's accurate to the termana campaign setting book yes termana termana the continent termana is like six times bigger than gelspad that's fine this place is gelspad about the size of the continental u.s um not counting canada not counting mexico just just that and as a as if somebody lives in the continental u.s it kind of i can see it in my head it's like three thousand miles or so wide this place is termana like eurasia ish really big um, a bigger, much bigger continent, cause the, the whole continent, not just one large country in the continent, but like all of it. And that's fine too, That's that makes sense. And there's three three other continents on Skarn, and they're all either about the size of Yelspad or a bit smaller. Um, so it's almost like the continents are almost like, except for Termana, are like the size of Australia, if you kind of think about it. Um, so it's four Australians and one Eurasia. Okay, five continents. So fewer, less land on Skarn than on Earth. And so now let's talk about the bad things about this map. <laughs> First of all, um, just going from top to down, you've got what's called the polar ice cap thing, which is sort of Fenrilic, which implies the Fenrilic is north of everything. And in the Fenrilic book, it says that it's north east or nor northwest of Gelsbad. That you travel northwest of Gelsbad, and implying that it takes almost as long to get there as it takes to get to Chermana. Not necessarily in distance, because it could take longer to get through because you're crushing through ice flow, and so not necessarily distance wise longer, but the same amount of time. Okay. That's in the that's in a later publication than the publication this book is in. And I do go with the rule that later publications beat earlier ones, with one notable exception, which is that other book I mentioned. 
So we've got that kind of weird thing. It also sh implies that the continent of Termana, or at least the ice caps, are bigger than Gelsbad, which the uh, Strangelands books says they're not. So, but, you know, when you see a map, layout and stretched out and you look at Antarctica it also looks like it's bigger than it is and so I'll hand wave that into map projection gishmickies you know it's like Greenland and Greenland looks huge and it's not okay we'll wave hand wave that of crappy map projection fine now we look at the rest of the map and this is where it hurts my brain because if you look at the measurements the distance that trade routes they show between Gelsbad to Termana is 10,000 miles with a freaking almost thousand mile trench in the middle of it where this is where Gadam is Kadam Gadam which is where Kadam is in, entombed basically 10,000 miles compare this to earth measurements so we're already dealing with less land mass than earth already um pole to pole on earth pole to pole is 12,000 miles. Scrumpets of the Earth is tw almost 25,000 miles. This trade route from southern Gelsbad to northern Termana, not counting the ranges of Gelsbad to the North Pole or Termana to the South South, that trade route is 10,000 miles, almost the length of the North Pole to the South Pole on Earth. I am not good at that kind of geometry of extracting <laughs> how big Skarn, how much bigger than Earth Skarn would have to be if you extrapolate from there. But I would say an easy way would be a shitload, like times bigger, like 10, 10 times bigger, maybe. I don't know, way bigger. <laughs> um, you know, I, you compare to similar distances, what on Earth is 10,000 miles? Nova Scotia in Canada, which is like, you know, where there's people living, you know, much, much further north through hitting Greenland, North Scotia, Canada, to South Africa, the very tip of Africa, is 7,500 miles. That's shorter <laughs> by thousands of miles than this trade route from Gelsman to Germania. The Mayflower, um, or close to Columbus, you know, and the uh, those guys, and in, in terms of in terms of technology level, we're talking. I, I always think of like this as like kind of Pirates of the Caribbean technology level. So so more more high tech than the Mayflower or Columbus, but but still, how long did it take? Would it have taken ships and the you know Spanish galleon in the 1800s to cross the Atlantic? I, I literally don't know, but I can't imagine it more than a few months. Like Columbus was like three months, something like that. From New York to Lisbon, Portugal, 3,300 miles-ish. Not 10,000. <laughs> so no one would make this flipping journey is my point. Okay. Like if you have, it's just, it's too much. It's just too much. Skarn's too big. You would not have a viable trade route and they're talking hundreds of ships all the time go trading through here there's pirates blah 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 pirates have no problems finding trade ships if the sea was this big it's like going through the freaking solar system you'd never find the ship you'd need some kind of well i mean okay they have magic you'd but you'd need some kind of major magic detection just to know that a ship was coming through an area it doesn't make sense so okay should i stop ranting now <laughs> So in in my book, in my head, what I would love to do is a rewrite for this. If we're, if 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 Five E decides to republish the, something like this map, and there, are, to my knowledge, are no plans to. But if there ever is, I would shrink this map to like I would make this a third the size it is because that would at least kind of make sense and make this more of a feasible thing. Because otherwise, these pirates are just going to be running around the Blood Sea not finding anything. <laughs> <laughs> just there you go now we can do magic so you can be like oh they can move faster because you, you have a sea witch who can make the wind blow and thus get to places faster than say columbus would have or, or the galleons of the 1800s would have because you have magic to help you 
So that helps, I guess. But you don't have engines, you know, so anything like that. And even now, to even today, after seeing the whole ever whatever from what is it from Suez Canal to the Cape of Good Hope to around Africa, basically, they said that was going to add two weeks of time. That's today's technology. So, you know, 150 years later, technology, it's still two weeks to get around Africa on a ship. It's not fast. <laughs> My point. <laughs> It'll just take a really long time. It would take like a year or more to get to Termana, and no one's going to do that. Uh, they would just teleport. <laughs> like, why would you not? Okay. All right. Should I stop ranting about this next <laughs> Okay, moving on. Um, so why don't they just teleport? Let's see. It's wacky. Um, okay, you, A, you need a really high level wizard, obviously, to teleport. But but um, teleporting across the Blitz is actually dangerous. Um, the Blood Sea, because of... So we, and we talk about, you know, they threw Cadam in the sea. at the bottom of this thing that's deeper than the Marianas Trench. The bottom of the sea, bleeding out and creating all this craziness. His... His, what they call it, his taint, his, what he's done to the water, what he's done to the region, has almost turned into another dimension, has, has really warped the area, and it's still slowly growing. Um, and this warping screws with everything. And so when you teleport, um, you know, normally um, we have regular in 3.5, in the 3x days when you teleport for I don't know about fourth edition 3x days when you teleported you'd have this mischance if you had regular teleport and you would not have the mischance with the greater teleport and in 5e um, you have a mischance with a with a teleportation with a teleport spell but if you're using a teleportation circle you don't have a mischance or or some other thing that lets you like I have this piece of the place I'm going and I I don't have the mischance. Well, if you're crossing the Blood Sea, teleportation circles, things, whatever they are, do not help you. You always have that mischance. Sliding it down, like one or two levels of that mischance meter. So odds of having a mishap, even when you're going to a known location with a teleportation circle, casting it at a high level, you still have a mischance. So there's that. You don't want your army to end up in Ashrak because <laughs> If you rolled on the mischance table and you blew it. So there is there is a greater chance of failure teleporting across the Blood Sea because of this weird interdimensional stuff. Um, so from, and specifically from Termana um, to Gel, pretty much from Gelsbad to anywhere but Fenrilic, you're going to run into this problem because you're going to be kind of crossing the Blood Sea. Why can't you go the other way around the planet? We talked about that in a previous episode. <laughs> but it's never been explained very well. Okay, so you've got that. In addition, you've got all the normal, horrible stuff about crossing a a, trim, trim, a, a really difficult ocean. Um, and you also have the fact that the ocean, percentage-wise, is made of blood, of, of not just any blood, but magical, crazy, evil blood um, that sometimes turns people messed up. But sometimes people are fine. That's, that's the other thing, is the blood is unpredictable. So you can ingest fish from the blood see your whole life and be perfectly fine and then your 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 kid eats one fish and boom they're growing gills or or weird second head or something um and bad things happen it's just weird and random and nobody understands it and why does this happen you know plot reasons basically but but whatever reason um there's that so you've got this this thing in the sea itself um, you've got blood rain because the water comes out of the sea and makes clouds and it will rain. The rain will have blood in it. We talked about the blood rains hitting Gelspad. They also hit Termana and, and obviously on the sea itself. You've got blood winds where um, mi like mist from the water when it comes like, you know, how waves come up against a boat. Imagine that, but the bl water's bloody. That causes decks to get disgusting and... Um, you're here swabbing the deck and all pirate things. Well, you've got to swab your deck like 10 times more often um, than in, in traditional, because it's, it's not just seawater you're cleaning up, but this tainted substance that's 
kind of destroying your ship much faster than just seawater will. And then you've got your magical blood monsoons, which are you know, basically hurricanes of blood and, and with, with, with various other things with them. Um, and they're like, and while the blood monsoon, the big multi-year event storm ended, there's still like mini storms that, that, that occur as plot needs. <laughs> so, so you have that to play with. Um, and I talk about the mutations you get from the Blood Sea. There's also um, diseases, specifically, um, and two which have almost identical names, which doesn't help. <laughs> um, uh, called blood fever and and um, uh, uh, blood fever is one of them. If you consume food contaminated by Cadmus blood. Um, or or drink the blood, but it's conceivable, or drink drink the oh, seawater. So you, you you drown, or you almost drown in seawater. Swallow some seawater, and you know, get you back alive, or whatever. Um, you swallowed some of it, you could get blood fever. You eat fish that's not been purified, you know, whatever. Get blood fever. Um, this causes a whole range of issues. Um, does and in the five E rule set, it does poison poison damage basically. Um, but when you survive, there's a chance you could mutate um, and grow, like I said, who knows what. You know, most of them are just like, oh, you, you get pustules or something. But, you know, extreme cases, um, there's sea creatures out in the Blood Sea that are mutants that have extra arms or arms at all or rage attacks or various things. There's a whole Blood Sea mutant table, things you can add to both creatures and conceivably to PCs um, if you get attracted to this. Um, but like it does poison damage, so you get that save at the end of every time period to see if you recover from it, assuming you're not magically recovered. If you drop to zero from this poison damage, this daily damage you take, um, your character, or a character, would die from you know, when they hit zero. But they wouldn't stay dead, because at that point they become a blood fever zombie. So Adam holds you even in death, and these mutations even continue. And so you got so like disposing of people who live in this region, particularly who live on the islands of the Blood Sea, is really important because otherwise you're just going to have zombies running around. So because every pretty much everybody lives in the Blood Sea on the shore, not necessarily. You can even live in Mithril or Herdrad and not be contaminated. Um, but folks who live on the islands, they don't have resources to clerics to bless the food. Um, they're way, way more likely to contract blood fever. Then we have this other thing, um, uh, uh, which is this almost the same name. <laughs> um, blood, there's these things called, uh, those are blood fever zombies. There's blood zombies minus the fever. Um, similar creature, uh, similar cause. Um, but in this case, uh, there's this specific uh, creature called a blood barnacle. So think of regular ship barnacles that show up on boats and docks and whatnot. Um, except these are screwed up blood bar barnacles. They call them blood barnacles. Very, very important to clean these off your ships. Very, very, very important to do a periodic check of your seagoing vessel on the Blood Sea every couple of days and clean these off. Because if you neglect cleaning your ship, and you don't clean it for a good week, these will form and start to grow. And then they will drive your crew insane. <laughs> and um, you don't, and it's blood, blood zombie disease is not poison gradually, it kills you and then you come up a zombie. No, blood zombie disease uh, for the blood barnacles is you get exposed to this and you just don't have to die first. You just turn into a blood zombie. <laughs> and basically die and are zombified without the whole days of illness kind of thing. Now, this one's quick and fast and um, spreads, I believe, I don't believe it's, one of them spreads through like uh, uh, liquid, like, you know, like throw up and, and bodily fluids. I think the blood, blood barnacle one does not spread by bodily fluids. It just spreads by exposure to these barnacles. But it's it's this madness. It starts as a madness and then you turn into kind of this, they call them zombies. Are they undead? As, uh, I don't know. The rule set's very, very similar. The only thing really different is the blood fever zombies have this spew attack and the blood barnacle zombies don't. But otherwise they're just CR1 
from fucked up zombies. Um, <laughs> there were one or two. <laughs> so, similar monsters in the 5e rule set, but different causes. Jeremy, where are you going? Okay, Jeremy's gonna leave me to talk about myself, talk on my own. That's fine. I don't need him. <laughs> Moving on. Okay, uh, we've got all sorts of nasty ha hazards in the Blood Sea. Um, nasty currents because of the uh, Cadam's um, stuff heats up the water. So it, it changes in terms of uh, changes how the water flows. You get these weird currents that occur. So it makes it a little more dangerous than that, whether you're above the ground or below it, or above the water line, above the surface or below. Um, all sorts of all sorts of monsters, as I implied. Um, in addition to mutant um, sea creatures, um, there's a several nasty ones uh, in the creature collection that you can you can see, um, including uh, grotesques, which are humanoids that have been transformed, um, razorfin dolphins. So it's kind of like your um, uh, hornsaw unicorn, um, except these are dolphins in there. Well, you know, the horn is the, the fin, is it? but similar in terms of personality. You, you don't want to, like, dolphins are sweet. Razorfin dolphins are horrible. Um, and uh, abyssal lamprey infestation. It's a parasite that will screw up um, animals that live on the coast of the Blood Sea or on the island of the Blood Sea, um, the, the land animals. And, you know, you've got a good one to four percent chance of any critter that lives on the shore like or seabird or something has an infestation of these horrible little lampreys that will like contaminate people and do all sorts of damage so there's our one l and the um and the scar twin uh do check that one out in the creature collection that is a a horrible monster i don't, I don't know if we pictures of that one there uh people get infected by the blood sea taint and then kind of go mad and get really obsessed um it's really weird <laughs> they make for a great plot um they make for a great low level um low level campaign plot of like a town has been affected by a scar twin and you're gonna figure out what's going on and that. it's a it's a fun mystery so just check that out um other uh more uh flora hazards um you get these uh kelp forests that are, that are kind of sentient almost because of the contamination. So think like awakened plants, like an awakened tree, except it's an entire kelp forest, probably trying to kill you. So <laughs> if you live under, if you're a secret merfolk or whatnot, they have to deal with, with the, you know, it's like, oh, it's a kelp forest. I'll just swim through the ad. Ah, it's trying to eat me. And, you know, <laughs> and they're horrible. Um, and you have hungry reefs. So, uh, you know, and the reefs can be massive, and you have these contaminated mutant reefs um, where mutant coral will spread and contaminate everything around them and just cause all sorts of mutations to people um, by being exposed to it. So, ugh. <laughs> um, and uh, also navigation gets tough, particularly around the shores, because um, the terrain keeps kind of shifting. Apparently, whenever Cadam kicks or something, where he's entombed, um, it can cause earthquakes and other um, volcanic eruptions and whatnot that ripple across the region. And since he's his substance fills the whole ocean, he kind of has a passive, I don't say control, but it it responds to him. So if Cadam is moody. <laughs> Which you think he figures he is all the time because, you know, who wants to be chained to the bottom of a trench? So if Cadam is moody, it could cause all sorts of nasty disruptions in the ocean. <laughs> or, like, you know, little underground earthquakes or things. So that's all other, these other hazards and causing whirlpools and, and, and the, the, um, uh, what do you call them? The, uh, the flows of the water will, will be disrupted and you don't know how that's gonna work and it's just it's just all kind of crazy <sighs> now, under the sea when you think about and given that you know no matter how big the ocean is Garn is still like 90 percent water um even if it was just the size of earth it would still be like 90 percent water um you've got a bunch of 
of sentient sea life. So you've got your mermaids, you've got your standard D and D underwater races, Kuatoa and um, Lock, 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 Lock. You know, I, can't pronounce I've that. never <laughs> known how to pronounce that, so I know what you mean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know what I mean. Tritons, the uh, or something like Locan- that. Something like that. Yeah, the the, the, the all the sea peoples. You know, right. You, I'm sure there's other D&D books that go deeper into the various sea races of D&D. But, so you've got all the standard, you know, whatever you want in there. Um, Scarred Lands calls out several. Um, or elves, whatever you want. Um, and But Scarred Lands has a, introduces a new, well, kind of two new ones. There's the Krakens, which are not new, but they're called Blood Krakens. So they're kind of Krakens, but worse. Um, there's Blood Tainted Tritons which are standard D&D Tritons, but they've got more Blood Sea mutations. And then you've got the completely new um, race called the Piscians. So it's like, I see it like sort of Pacific, P-I-S-C-E-A-N, Piscian. Um, I, you know, I can't pronounce anything in the Scarred Lands. Um, and the Piscians were the race that did well. So the, the when Kadam happened and, and his contamination hit, hit the waters and there was like these beautiful merfolk underwater cities and all this stuff in that region and the contamination just hit them most of the races in that region did very badly like a lot of them just died or mutated or went insane but i guess those with already kind of a we'll say sour temperament yeah who were already just adjusted they're like oh our, our environment has adapted to us now. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So the Piscians did quite well. Yeah. And, and they didn't, they, maybe they were already insane, but they adapted to it and, and thrived in this environment. And they were just sort of these weird green mer people. And then suddenly started to develop black and red hues and um, started being able to uh, cast magic and, and other kind of innate abilities. So, Piskins kind of grew into this, you know, it's weird kind of funky mer people too. Badass, scary mer people. Um, I, I think the the green, black, and red colors make me think of Slod. Oh yeah. Um, I, I I always, even though they're mer people, I was like, they're kind of like mer Slod. <laughs> That's totally fair. I mean, not not really, but I always use my Slod minis because yeah, I've got the, the the right colors. Um, although they don't they don't map to Slod one to one, but but it, it has kind of a similar vibe. Um, the red ones are these big hulking monsters, and the black ones are smaller, but they're spellcasters and they're really badass. So, and then I think the black ones lead, um, and the it's the hue changed because of their exposure to the the blood. So, there's these guys, um, and then we've got um, uh, yeah. So that's kind of kind of what's going on. Um, so beneath the in the beneath the sea, I'll start talking about that first. Um, Way back in the day, um, there was this these krakens who were kind of the most powerful creatures in the sea because they're well. Back in the day, they were colossal. They're gargantuan now, and five e. But does gargantuan have an upper limit, really? Um, so they're freaking huge. I can't even say the word huge because huge is a thing. <laughs> they're at least forty feet long or longer. <laughs> How's that? or bigger um the krakens and they they kind of dominated the region there weren't a lot of them but they tended to bully all the other all the other merfolk as you know intelligent merlife and um and there was this these two sibling krakens um called i want to get their names right um ran and her brother uh uh, their name, full names were Kul Al Nuran and Tak Al Nur Wu. So Wu and Ran, I guess. I I don't know what Ku and Tak mean. I guess they're their full name. You never call Queen Ran by her full name. Anyway, it was these two Krakens siblings, and um, Ran decided she wanted to take control um, and um, kind of threatened her brother and uh, built up a bit of an army and went to attack him and he kicked her ass. <laughs> and she was like, well, that sucked. She just arrived. She kind of wandered off and when it found this like kind of trench underwater and 
started sleeping there basically and just went i'm gonna go here and lick my wounds and feel shitty about life so she goes down there and then, and then adam gets hucked into the sea Cadam falls in this trench that near where she was sort of hibernating wakes her up because suddenly there's all this goo appears and the you know, earthquakes and all this other stuff she wakes up and gets gets infected by this tainted blood like immediately she's like one of the first creatures that it hit because it was right where it happened and um and given her nature she adapts to it really fast <laughs> and um immediately gains power from it and over the course of a very very short amount of time starts to gain powers that no kraken's ever had before and suddenly she can cast spells and and do all these these great things and is, is way more badass meanwhile her brother who had kicked her ass not long before also at a little bit later time as the sea as the blood spreads he gets contaminated along with everything else in the region but it drives him insane and not in a good way um, or in a, in a, not in a productive way, but um, he basically loses control of his kingdom. So she gathers up a bunch of new mutants, not to do a weird X-Men thing, but <laughs> a bunch of bunch of, of folks who've been recently muted, those who did well, like, like the Piscians, and went and attacked him, and basically just took over the region and became the badass force of the Blood Sea. She then built this from this phenomenal palace. Oh, hello, this phenomenal palace right on the edge of the trench where Cadam was, um, and had like basically ruled the region. And then she got greedy and decided she wanted. Not that there's anything wrong with that. Um, but decided she wanted um, what was on land, and she sent the blood monsoons, or that she's they they claim she sent the blood monsoons, but she's definitely sent the forces that back them up. Um, as she had her Pisky and then various other creatures invade the land during the monsoon and, and attack various areas like Mithril and Hadrad and, and coastal towns and villages up and down the Gelspad coast, going all the way as far south as Calastia. Um, this lasted for a long time and cost ran a lot because the coastal regions were a little more defendable than were unexpected and her army was kind of get their asses kicked um when the monsoon ended why it ended still not clear but um the piscians she'd sent got kind of irritated at her and basically mutinied and or rebelled depending on how you want to go with the pirate term or not and we're like we don't want to work for you anymore and we're going to call off and do our own thing and for the next 20 years ran and the piscians had a nice little war and then and she was getting her ass kicked um, despite her power, she couldn't be everywhere at once. So she made an alliance with a preacher, new in power, called um, the Jack of Tears, or Momus, in the Blood Bayou in northern Termana. And Momus sent her, sort her, supported her, and gave her resources and 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 military strength in form of mutant shark people, um, among others. And she claimed her, had a solid claim on her area. So as things stand today, Queen Ran controls um, pretty much from that trench where Kadam is entombed, that whole region in south. And the Piscians control everything north um, toward Gelspad. So on the Gelspad coast itself is pretty much controlled by the Piscians. As a result, travel across the Blood Sea wasn't already difficult enough because of all the other things I already mentioned. But also, um, when they see you, these Piscians will come up to a vessel and go, "You'll pay us our taxes. You'll pay us tribute. If to, uh, we will not, we will let you travel if you pay us um, a certain percentage of money, and you go on your way." And they, they, they you, if you pay them, they give you like a little tablet stamp thing with like a date on it, going, "Okay, if another Piscian patrol shows up, just show them this, and they'll let you go because they'll know you already paid." <laughs> This sort of works if people are willing to pay the Piscians. It's like paying the troll across the bridge. Except then you have to deal with Queen Ran's patrols once you get past <laughs> that region. So if you're going to the areas of Termana that she controls. So all sorts of problems there. Or do you just fight the Piscians? Do you just fight her for it? So it's a big, big sticky mess. Um, no pun intended. <laughs> So yeah, it's it's 
it's crazy there. Piskins also have a bit of a society under um, under the under the waves. Um, they have uh, specifically the book talks about their Western Empire, which is the empire of the Piskins, right, like adjacent to Gelspad. Um, they have multiple underwater cities built in cliff faces, about 300 or so feet deep. Um, they they do kind of funky things. They create these magical um, heat sources, like like vents, like volcanic vents, but they use magic to create updrafts, which create kind of like elevators. You know, they can they can swim and everything, but like like I think that's neat. They're like like we, we use this to go up and down in our. Um, in our uh, these cliffside fortresses that we make, these cities we make. Interesting thing about Piskins, most of them don't have dark vision, which I thought was weird because undersea creatures you expect to have dark vision, but mo not some of the Piskins. I think some of the Piskins do, but a lot of them don't. So they use this stuff called evergreen, which is really neat. Um, and it and a lot of the Mer people, um, the, the Tritons use it as well. Um, create this. It's kind of this moss lichen stuff. It grows really well underwater and it glows so they harvest it and they just smear it all over everything to, as a light source that that doesn't you know like a fire which wouldn't work underwater or um, an expensive spell which would work underwater but they're you know you need casters to create them um this is kind of used by anybody one day or not and they can just they just smear it on stuff and it glows for about a week and then they just reapply it they just grow this stuff um so uh, in fact our plot in um Mist of Algos, um, one of the, the plot points is that uh, this town um, is, hard, is creating this evergreen, but it's a special evergreen that if you smear it on a boat, it keeps blood barnacles from growing. Because we made it up. Why not? Some, <laughs> some component alchemy thing. And uh, the pirates obviously are interested in that because they can put it on their boat um, to keep the blood barnacles from Growing, although it does make your boat glow. So, do, do pirates want glowing ships? <laughs> There's that little debate. Maybe it makes them more intimidating. Um, alternatively, you can use this special tar from Mithril um, on your ships that will also reduce um, the speed in which blood barnacles grow. But uh, I think that's evergreen's kind of a cool thing as, a, as an alchemical thing. Um, and that's there's rules on it, and um, and I believe there's it's mentioned in the uh, Blood Sea Five E book as well. It is. Yes. Um, the oh, there's my cover. Um, the Western Empire of the Piscians has uh, four major regions, um, depending on kind of the what's there. Um, most of them aren't super interesting. But there is this area called the Treaty Wall, which is right off of the God Face Cliff, off of the big um, Celestial Shelf Peninsula in Eastern Gelsbad. Um, and this is kind of a neat thing. The, the wall was built um, when the Kraken and the Piscians kind of made peace, or rough peace, like basically. And Queen Rand's like, okay, fine, I'll be here, I'll be there. And, um, split the region. But it, the, the actual area is a lot older than that. Um, they, they kind of built it up because of that to be like your your side, my side. But but um, there's a bunch of Slorasian artifacts down there. Slorasian gatekeepers. It's just these weird, potentially interdimensional gates. If you can figure out how to make them work, are in that area. So and the area is untainted. Like some of the only underwater um, in the Blood Sea. Uh, that isn't bloody, basically. So it's like a pure water area within the Blood Sea. Uh, presumably from water that's coming out of these area, potentially out of these Slorasian gates, maybe. It's not clear. It's like lots of vague hand waving, depends on what the GM wants to do with that. Um, but, uh, uh, and, and Black Piscians who go into that specific region actually get damaged because they're not exposed to Cadam's blood, and so they get really unhappy because <laughs> the waters are pure. So that's a neat little area right there. Um, uh, let's see. And there's several other uh, cities of the Piscians. Um, they where they kind of do their like go as a central point, and then send out their patrols to 
trade ships and be like, give us the money. Um, so a potential cool underwater adventures um, could be taken in some of these. There's a watchtower where all the treasure is stored from the ill-gotten tax collection. Um, there's a trade city um, where they, they kind of centralize Piskin trade with other regions. Um, they keep slaves of most of the other <laughs> sea-dwelling races. And depending on which race you are, you may be treated better or worse. So um, it's it's better to be a apparently a uh, lo that one we can't pronounce. Locath, lo Locath, uh, <laughs> Locatha. Oh, Is there an N in Kentha? it? Kentha? No. Okay, L O C. So lo lo L-O-C-A-T-H-A-A. It's better to be one of them, probably because they're bad or evil, um, than it is to be, say, a, uh, a sea elf or something. Because <laughs> they're treated much more poorly. Um, and uh, uh, Merfolk or Kuotoa are not treated nearly as nicely. Um, but they're all still pretty much treated like slaves under the Piscian rule of this region. So that all kind of sucks. Um, and you'd find them... Um, certain percentage of the population in these Piscian communities will be slaves. So, because that's fun. Um, but there you go. So, somebody could, if you did an underwater campaign, a lot of potential there. Um, and um, also just gathering Cadam's blood for various nefarious experimentations that they will perform on that subdued population. Because they do things like that. Um, as well as um, undead and elementals that tend to show up a lot because blah. Bleh. Um, bleh. Going deeper into the, into, so that's kind of the Piskin region. Going deeper into the ocean, you hit the celestial shelf. I, I love, I, I, uh, the continental shelf, not sorry, sorry, celestial shelf, the thing. You hit the continental shelf. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm amused by this. So, so the continent, it's like, not like when you step off a beach and the ocean suddenly goes deep. It takes a while. There's, it's like a kind of a slope as you reach until you reach the end of the continental shelf, and then it just gets massively deep ocean. That's the way it works in Earth. This is also the kind of way it works in Skarn. I have sat on the bottom of the Pacific as, a, as an scuba diving. To say I've sat on the bottom of the Pacific isn't really true. I have sat on underwater in the Pacific Ocean, in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, on sand underwater. Um, th uh, uh, a mile offshore of the Big Island of Hawaii, <laughs> which is not technically, it is technically off the continental shelf, but it's its own, you know, tallest island, or tallest, tallest mountain in the world, not the highest, but the tallest mountain in the world, because the bottom of the mountain is on the bottom of the Pacific. Um, it was cool, don't get me wrong, but I was 30 feet underwater. <laughs> if you actually reach the bottom, of that of the big island of hawaii's isle of uh, mountain it's miles down not feet so you get to the end of the continental shelf you know so it's like oh it's feet down it's 300 feet down so these piskin cities 300 feet down near the coast you get to the deep abyss where cadam is where queen ran is that's deep mind-bogglingly deep <laughs> that's like like you, know, you see those videos of like, there's nothing down there. There's nothing down there. Um, Queen Ran is on kind of is, is a is a city on a plateau that overlooks that chasm. But you go keep going down there, and it's dark. And eventually you get down there, and there's and in the trench itself, there's not just Cadam because Cadam's like attracted all sorts of crazy shit. You know, there's mutant monsters and whatnot. You know, Leviathan, giant whale-like mutant whales. Um, and devils and demons have flocked to him for mysterious reasons. And it's possible that there's dimensional gates in that trench that lead to the Abyss or, or Chardoon's Nine Hells or something like that, or both. So there's all sorts of just nasty monsters and horrors down there. Um, so even Queen Ran, it's distant, you know. So she's underwater, but she's just like, <laughs> we're, gonna, we're, we're, we're keeping an eye on it, but they're like over here, up on a plateau, looking down. You know, plateau, then bottom, then then trench. 
um, and then let the bottom of these, and there's there's multiple, you know, that's the big one that Cadam's in, but there's other kind of, you know, cracks in the ocean bed, and they call them gore trenches, because it's where the blood pools and gathers and is all like, look, and going through those regions. Um, so normally it's like underwater regions, you know, you'll, you'll, kelp will try to eat you and, you know, whatever. But if you get in those deep areas, um, it's so thick, particularly in those gore trench areas, it's so thick with the with the blood, it's like just solid red fog and there's no visibility beyond if, if there was because there's no light, but even if you have dark vision, it's not going to help you. Um, and more tainted creatures, more quickly getting exposed to the taint, more likely to, to develop mutations or poisons. Um, and uh, can big congealed blood blobs of massive size. You know, it's gross. <laughs> it's just gross. I should have had a trigger warning. The Bennett. Oh my god, is Let's that a see. jellyfish? Be... No, it's just a blob of blood. Blood. It's and yes, gross. it's moving. <laughs> <laughs> and then there's some certain level of, of intent. So, and you know, and that's in addition to just like whatever else is down there right. so yeah you know, undead and and various volcanic vents of sea creatures and you know i just picture like like think um what the most horrible sea creatures were those um wonderful um the, the fish with the with the thing with the, the, the big teeth why am i flaking on the name um uh i'm gonna say fish or fish that's not right Oh, anglerfish. Anglerfish, yeah. Like, that's what I'm thinking, fisherfish. <laughs> anglerfish. Like, I'm just imagining a mutant anglerfish. Right. But, like, you know, a massive gargantuan mutant anglerfish. You know, that's the kind of shit you'd find. <laughs> just, just awful. Awful stuff. So, so that's under the sea. Am I missing anything under the sea? You know, so, Pisking, Twin Ran. I mean, there's a Z-Rex. lot of monsters listed for the Blood Sea, so I, <laughs> I do. There was yeah. an entry that talked about the Gore Squid and essentially how even the Blood Krakens are like, let's just leave them down there. We won't fuck with them, and that'd be great. And we'll just yeah. ignore their existence and hope they don't remember that there's stuff above them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like there, because you know, it gets me though. Is like, even even if this ocean was the size of just Germana, it's massive. That's massive, you know. And we know we get a sense of how big the Pacific is, and it's if it was the size of the Pacific, which it's on this on the super map at the beginning, it's like six times the size of the Pacific. Right. Just the blood. Thing, never mind the rest of the oceans on Skarn. Um, Skarn is so much ocean. <laughs> you know, yeah. Even if it was the size of Earth, it's massive, and and that realm is is there's just so much unknown and so much to play with. So I don't. I I, I need to run a. a a merfolk campaign at some someday. Yeah, it'd be fun. <laughs> it'd be real fun for sure. Okay, moving to the surface, and there's a, a series of islands we did not. So we talked about the Toe Islands last time. Then there's this other group of islands called the Harch Hearts Blood Archipelago, or Archipelago, as I used to pronounce it when I was a kid. <laughs> It's called Something about Legos, to, whatever. <laughs> I, I, I learned how to pronounce things by reading them <laughs> and not actually hearing them spoken. Um, it's just a series of islands created by small, connectable blocks, right? <laughs> Archipelago. <laughs> it's right. a logo, archipelago. Archipelago. <laughs> um, and um, so this, this group of islands is really close to Cadam's Trench. So... Um, so like Crunch Islands and you know Queen Ran, all of that is in the same little region. Um, and I, I kind of love this map. Um, so I'll, I'll go through, call through these islands, I guess. Yeah. Okay. So sure. um, I kind of got these in a random order. I think I have them in like alphabetical order. <laughs> so that's where they were in the book. <laughs> so I apologize works. if I'm kind of bouncing all over the landscape here. Um, uh, I want to get this open as well here on my page so I can see the map. Um, starting with Dead Moon Isle, which is. I'm looking at the wrong map, so I gotta pull up my map. Um, uh, it's it's small, one of the smaller islands, and there's one person living there. 
Like you think about like, oh, these are all these inhabited islands. This one's not really so much. Um, it's there's this ogre named Krasun. Um, totally evil. And he's they call him a child of Kadam. I don't know if that means he's like Kadam created him directly, or if he's just a follower of Kadam. Right. But he's badass enough that I would go with Kadam created him directly. <laughs> Um, and he spends his time on this little island, um, plotting Kadam's return. Um, and, um, but his, his means of doing it, he's, he's, he's connected to this organization, um, called the, uh, let me get the organization right. I'm skipping around in my notes too much. I apologize. It's called the Heart Seekers of Kadam, um, which there's a whole bunch of crazy druids and, and, giants and mutants and ogres and whatnot who's creations of Kadam and followers of Kadam who want to bring him back but they're not like oh we're gonna swim down into the trench and break the chains off that's not gonna that's not gonna do it um they're they they know or they believe firmly that they need to find his heart and reclaim it and stick it back in him and that will give him his power back and that without his heart He's just powerless, and that that kind of maps. Yeah, yeah kind of maps to why and, why. I mean, if he was going to break his chains, he would have done so. It's been 150 years. Come on, you know. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and it also maps that oh, that's how they defeated. Him. Why did Bell Smith rip his heart out? Right. Because that's the only way they could defeat him. She 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 figured it out. She learned about it. Um, and I have my own theories on how she figured it out. But so Bell Smith took his heart. So these this um, ogre. And his his various associa association um, really have the hate on for followers of Belsmith, which is interesting because like evil people against evil people. Yeah. <laughs> um, and they are looking for the heart. I was I was entertained by this because other lore and maybe it's just not as well known as I assumed it was. Um, other lore implies that Belsmith took the heart and brought it with her to her her um, her her uh, throne room or temple or whatever city on the moon. And we make a joke about it in Vigilant that's like, I oh, will take this to the moon, you know, <laughs> and, and the, the Bellsmith takes it to the moon and, and sticks it in a box and it's a footstool. She sits on her throne and she puts her feet up on a box that has Cadam's heart in it. It's just great. It's just the imagery is beautiful and very, very Bellsmith. Um, so it's like, why aren't they like trying to build like a dimensional gate to the moon or, a, I don't know, a rocket ship or something? <laughs> So they're searching around the blood steps. What are they doing? Um, if you want confirmation, this is where it is. They should be building an army to invade the moon. Um, I don't know. So I think that's kind of interesting, though. Plot point that, for uh, a future adventure. Yeah. yeah. How, does, how do the finders of Kadab's heart get their asses on the moon? <laughs> and will it even be there if they arrive there? Um, so there's that. All right, moving on. Um, apparently alphabetically. Um, the next one is Haven, which is actually three islands kind of clumped together. Um, these are connected by enchanted rope bridges. They're pretty close. Um, if you look at the scale, um, you know, they're only, there's not even like, like, well, it's still like a good mile between each one, but I, I don't know how, how proper the scale is. But it's these rope bridges that connect them. They're enchanted, so the rope bridges are more stable than you anticipate. Um, and the, uh, those rope bridges and the community there, uh, uh, they decided to do it in uh, 122 AV, 10 years after the Blood Monsoon. Um, a group of monks decided to build an outpost on an island in the middle of the Blood Sea for reasons. As one does, right? <laughs> I'm like, okay. Um, and this is a, a, a group of monks who are, uh, some of them are monks from Mithril, um, lawful good monks, and some of them are monks from Hadrad, lawful neutral monks. And they kind of gathered together in this you know, group, and over the course of four years, very quietly, so that like various folks weren't aware this was happening, they slowly sent resources out to these islands to build this monastery on the largest island of these three. Um, and they are autonomous kind of doing their own thing. They have nothing to do with the pirates in the area. Um, and they just have sort of peaceful little monastery. There's a watchtower. Um, 
on one of the other islands and there's like a little meditation grove on the littlest island uh, where they kind of do their thing um and it's like part of his devotion to Corian and Hedrata and it's like in the middle of of pirateness you've got this little lawful haven of funky monks so there's them I don't know why they did it but <laughs> that's the thing okay continuing our alphabetical way we have the hungry reefs which are kind of uh, run through the whole our archipelago, like a, like a sneaky line. Really hard to navigate around and through. Um, so not really a place where anyone lives per se, um, but those in the know can use them to either shake off pursuers or to get um, foes to crash against, and then they can go in and take out their ships. So lots of ship battles take place on the reefs. Lots of shipwrecks are on these reefs. Um, and lots of blood zombies are on these reefs because pretty much what happens is blood barnacles grow on the reefs, shipwreck happens, survivors turn into blood zombies, and you get undead. Living, not living, existing, inhabiting these reefs. As well as spirits of other people who died that didn't get zombified. Um, and these various undead, you know, ship will come by and they'll swim out to it and screw up the hull and you know, make all sorts of chaos. Um, one known um, non-undead entity is a absolutely batshit crazy druid named um, Matt Zool, who's called an ill trawler, um, which is a, a a thing, you know, one of those prestige class things from the old days. Um, they uh, ill trawlers specifically use nets to dredge stuff out of the blood sea, and you know sometimes they're like treasure and whatnot. And, flocks them and jets and things that are useful but also they trawl clots to make stuff out of them like alchemical things and all sorts of nasty potions and whatnot out of Cadam's blood it's like so, the, uh, the blood sea recycling program i feel like yeah yeah <laughs> except not in a good way <laughs> so and he'll he'll like attacks passing ships with you know his druid summons abilities and He's not, a, he's not a very nice fella. So, moving on, we have uh, back to, up to the northern end is Minhar's Folly. Oh, no, we should do Lush Isle. Well, I'm going to skip Lush Isle, because that is next alphabetically, but I'm going to save it for last. So, I'm going to go to Minhar's Folly first. Um, Lush Isle is kind of too, too big. <laughs> I'm going to do that one last. So, Minhar's Folly, covered in a jungle, and mostly known for its giant, massive crabs. So, think, you know, Monster Manual is big crabs except they're mutants, so nasty crabs, and a rare drug, or, or a rare flower, called Evening's Whisper, that only blooms at night, and if you collect the pollen, it makes this cool drug called Folly, which is very popular amongst people who like drugs. <laughs> um, and uh, Minhar was the one who first discovered it, um, and thus the island is named after him. Um, he uh, was this alchemist explorer who discovered the flower, made drugs out of it, sold it in shells art, became super popular. Um, then he died um, on the island, uh, killed by a gallows vine because, bleh. Um, and uh, various folks now go to this island to collect the pollen, although it's also very, very dangerous um, because of these carnivorous plants and, and the giant crabs. So. <laughs> Not as dangerous as other places in Skarn, certainly, but eh, not super safe. Um, and the flowers, flowers are nearly impossible to find during the daytime, because they kind of look like everything else, but in the nighttime they bloom into these beautiful plants, which are pollinated by bats. Kind of neat. So, they got some, some cool stuff there. Alright, continuing in my alphabeticalness, um, there's the Reef of the Lost, which is in the very, very tail end. Um, we talked about the Hungry Reefs. Well, this last reef along that line is special, you know, not that carnivorous reefs aren't already special, <laughs> but this one um, is even is, is more tragic. Um, as if you actually go to it and look and see it, instead of just like a coral reef, it looks like streaming people in a coral reef, which is kind of horrible. Um, and uh, it, uh, the legend goes that um, this reef was part of the uh, 
merfolk city of pearls um, and, and grew from that. And that when Kadam's blood hit the city of pearls, which would have been pretty early because this is so close to where the trench is, um, Manawi, uh, like, they couldn't, it was just too fast. And the people were just immediately dying and mutating. And Manawi basically couldn't save them fast enough. Um, I mean, she probably got out who she could. She's the goddess of the sea. One of the goddesses of the sea. Um, got out who she could maybe, but um, she, to just ease their suffering quickly, turned a bunch of them into coral as a way to survive. As, maybe not as individuals anymore, but as sort of a, a organic consciousness. So the Reef of the Lost is a sad place. Of, it's potentially vaguely conscious reef that's made of the souls of thousands of dead merfolk. Um, um, and uh, followers of Manawi frequently come there in pilgrimages um, and leave uh, flowers and offerings, and not flowers, but leaves offerings and, and, and chase off things that would make it awful. Like, no ill trawlers can come here. Go. Um, so followers of Manawi kind of take care of it, but it's tragic. All right, and then uh, continuing alphabetically, we've got Riggin, right in the middle of, of the uh, archi archipelago. archipelago. Um, this is this is the classic. Oh my God, native conqueror. This one this one hurts my brain in modern day. <laughs> Um, the, Rig, the island of Riggin is populated by the Rig people, who call themselves in their language the folk. They're basically Polynesians, <laughs> basically native Hawaiians, effectively. Um, people who used to live on Lush Island, um, who uh, Lush Island, uh, I haven't talked about Lush Island yet, but Lush Island was a, has a big volcano in the middle of it that erupted when Kadam was sucked in the sea. Um, volcano eruptions, they fled and they're suspiciously outrigger-looking canoes <laughs> um, to this other island to es es escape, survive from volcanic eruption, and repopulated there. They um, short humans, bronze-colored skin, dark hair and eyes. Um, they wear minimal clothing and decorate their wrists and ankles with bracelets made of sinew, wood, bone, and coral. They use blowguns, spears, and daggers. Oh, it's a parallel to Polynesian culture, basically. <laughs> um, they want Lush Isle back um, now that it's a little bit safer, but that Lush Isle has now been populated by a bunch of pirates who don't want to give it back to the natives. So you've kind of got a little bit of strife there. And I'll get into that more when we get to the history of Lush Island. Um, okay, I'll talk more about Riggin when we get to that. Um, and then finally, uh, an alphabetical before we get to Lush Island, there's Widow Shore, which is that island to the far uh, west of the archipelago. Um, before the area came the, became the Blood Sea, this was just a lovely little supply port that many uh, merchants would use because it has a phenomenal fresh water source. And it was really nice. Like these nymphs were there and you'd get off your boat and you'd see these sexy nymphs and they'd be like, would you like some water? And you'd be like, yes, we would. This is so nice. And people would like want to stop there. It's too small for a settlement or anything like that. But it was a great little supply port run by the nymphs. They were groovy. Um, as long as you did, were nice, they would give you water. Well, then then Cadam's fall occurred and the nymphs mutated into um, what are called uh, blood maidens. <laughs> And they're not happy, nice people anymore, and they will rip your head off. <laughs> so the fresh water is still there. Good luck getting it. <laughs> it's the horrible blood veins will, will, will consume you if you try. Um, rumor is that um, Queen Neferos, who we talked about last uh, episode, has a treasure buried somewhere on this island and knows how to get past the blood, the, uh, the blood maidens. So that's a little thing. All right. Finally, Lush Island, that I that I rudely skipped. Um, big island, uh, largest island of the archipelago, and um, both the least and most dangerous, and but certainly the most populated. Um, sheer cliff walls are on the north um, because there, uh, when the volcano erupted, um, there was a big like, say mudslide sort of, but a 
big section of the island kind of crashed into the sea. It's creating these sheer cliffs. Um, volcano in the middle. Um, uh, and uh, in the south, there's this huge lagoon. And then kind of sprinkled around the whole region is this jungle where, you know, the, the plants that have grown up in the volcanic rock. And every once in a while, the volcano just spits more lava down and destroys some of it. And then over the course of a few more, a few years, it grows back. Things do grow faster in the Blood Sea um, than they would in other regions because of the just nutrient richness of the Blood Sea um, and all of that wonderful stuff. So it is very um, thick, jungly island, except for the um, little lagoon in the south. And um, um, let's see, the lagoon um, is where Bloodport is found. Um, which is this settlement. I kind of call it a city, but it's, it's a broad worm town, big town. It's this, this is, this we, we joked about Freeport um, being in, you know, the Toe Islands. If there's a Freeport in Skarn, it's this, um, is Bloodport on Lush Island. Um, it is one of two places on Skarn called Bloodport, which is okay, you know, that happens. But when people say Bloodport, 90% of the time, this is the one they're talking about. <laughs> this is the famous one. Um, um, and basically the way it worked is um, uh, many, many years ago, um, uh, after the Regan folks had fled the island, um, a uh, ship called the Quarry Shark went, you know, hit, hit a storm um, and got like hit and storm and they uh, managed to limp their way to this island and the ship was just wrecked um, probably on the hungry reefs and the survivors made it to this island and just took wreckage from the ship and built they could build another ship they couldn't they were pretty much stranded there so they built some crappy houses and discovered this place wasn't that bad so as other ships came into the region they just started turning this into a town because when you're traveling across the Blood Sea as in merchant ships from Termana to Galspad, there's not much in the middle of, this, of, of, of that region to stop. And this became the spot. It's Bloodport. Um, primarily used by pirates. Merchants do go through here um, and they're welcome. <laughs> but um, uh, it's it's a steep price if you want to actually stop here because it is run and controlled entirely by ne'er do wells. Um, it is not like mithril or 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 even shells are in terms of of like organization or I mean shells are obviously very organized but but in terms of like friendliness or or whatnot it's it's nasty pirates. It's ruled by these. Um, group of organization called the meat of dogs which dog is from the term sea dog um and which rotates kind of on a regular basis but the the ones that are running it and as a 150 are five um individuals we'll call them who basically run the island um and whenever there's any threat to the island or some rule they need to change or some other kind of major decision needs to be made, the five of them will meet and they'll vote and they will decide what they're going to do. So, for example, the Riggin, those folks, want their island back because they consider the volcano sacred. Kind of like, um, like uh, in Hawaii. Um, and they won't, they're like, you, you sacrilegious get off our island then. But they don't have the the strength, even though they outnumber the pirates quite a bit, good 10 to 1, um, they don't have the weaponry. So, you know, they got primitive spears, the pirates have armor, they've got swords and broadswords and, and, and magic. Um, and so the, the rigans show up and they just, you know, kick them out. So this, the sea dogs will meet to discuss, you know, how we're going to do about the rigan problem, and you know, what are we going to do about the Kraken problem, whatever, or Queen Ran is causing a fuss. You know. um, so they get together and, and make those decisions. And usually, and they don't even have like a government building or anything. They'll just meet in the back room of a tavern. <laughs> like, like. so the PCs will be like, oh, we want to know who runs Lush Island or runs Bloodport. It's like, oh, well, you can, they'll, they'll be meeting in the, the tavern tomorrow, you know. 
Which is so <laughs> Pirates of the Caribbean, Tortuga. It's like, so Tortuga, yeah. Yeah, that, that scene written, where all of the, the pirate lords are meeting, it's exactly what crosses my mind. And this was written way before those movies <laughs> yeah. came out. You remember, this book was written in like 2000. 2002, 2003, something like that. So well before any of the Pirates of the Caribbean movies came out. So I and I love it, and I totally picture that. Um, so um, the the city itself is broken up into districts. Um, we've got the docks. The there's the larboard docks, which is the left side of the wharf. There's just the nasty, cheapy docks where you know crap ships come in. Um, and the lagoons. The lagoon itself is is shallow. It is low. Um, some large ships can get in if they're very shallow ships, but um, the big ships anchor offshore in the, in the ocean and they'll take like small boats out. But um, those smaller ships can easily dock, or the or the rowboats can dock in, in the um, larboard docks. Um, interesting little tidbit on this was um, the dock master Drisk has this whole uh, horde of children who work for him. And people with ships pay him not to have the children rob them. <laughs> like they pay pay the dockmaster money to keep his children off of their ship from robbing their ship. But he'll still send the children to scope it out and find out what their cargo is, and then sell the information to other people to rob the ship. <laughs> it's not a very safe place to keep your cargo. <laughs> the opposite side, the starboard docks, um, which are the nice docks, um, they're completely controlled by the meat of dogs. Um, and basically, the meat of dogs are the only people who use it. <laughs> and not even all of them are sea captains, only, only a couple of them are sea captains. Um, but you can get like permission from one of them to use their docks. And they've got a, they're strict, you know, none of that children running around here. You know, your, your ship's pretty safe here in terms of as safe as it could be in Bloodport. Um, Bloodport itself is is truly nasty. I mean, it's a tropical island. The weather is basically rain, humid. Um, there's no sewage system. Their their way of getting rid of waste is waiting for the rain to come and solution it into the into the lagoon. This is not a pretty beautiful lagoon. You want a pretty beautiful lagoon? Go to Haven. This is a nasty, contaminated, sewage lined lagoon. <laughs> I mean, not that there is a beautiful lagoon here, because you're still in the middle of the Blood Sea, but but this is, you know, in addition to the blood stink, you also have the poop stink and the whatever else is going on here. So, and most of this settlement is these tiny little ramshack buildings, very, very few sturdy structures, um, lots of areas with not even any permanent structures, just shitty lean-tunes. Lean-tunes. Um, there's a section called the Warrens, which... The streets, most of the streets in Bloodport are single person. Like not even forget getting a wagon or something through here. You can barely get you through here. If you're large, like oh, I'm a scrag, you know, you're squeezing through these streets. <laughs> They're so narrow, um, single file kind of thing. I have no idea how that traffic passes. And people are dumping sewage on your head as you go by. So it's totally the nasty. The umbrella industry is huge there. Yeah, you think? <laughs> I don't even poop on my head. I'm gonna right. have an umbrella. <laughs> so this is just terrible. Um, so um, there's um, and there's various things. The Pelf's Point, which is uh, uh, top of the hill, um, is a little bit better because that's where the that's where the uh, the either the, the current or, or previous members of the Meat of Dogs have their homes. They're more permanent homes if they, if they uh, live on <laughs> live in the city. Um, uh, and, they, and one of the things known in Pelf's Point is they have these charms that they hang on, build on their properties and buildings and lands and whatnot and on you know, lampposts and whatnot that are supposed to keep away the blood sea taint. So, you know, if you're near a charm, you'll be okay and you won't get... They're like maybe 20% effective. <laughs> like, you might find one that's really magical if you're lucky. <laughs> um, basically give you advantage to the don't catch blood fever uh, 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 constitution saving throw. Maybe. Maybe, if you're lucky. Um, uh, and then uh, 
um, palisade wall runs along the, uh, well, the the jungle side of the uh, of the city, as you can see. Um, and they it's ten feet high uh, in the palisade. Um, gates always locked, just about, um, but they don't really guard it very much because what's the threat? The island itself doesn't uh, really have a lot of uh, threatening life. Most of the threats are carnivorous plants. As I said, with the um, Minhar's Folly and some of the other islands, there aren't a lot of predators on the island. Um, most of the animal life are like rats that came in on ships or small rodents or seabirds. Um, not, you're not going to find wolves on this island. But you will find gallows plants and various other nasty plants that will try to eat you. So... Um, this is this is where you'd find one of them. Those what are they? Trindiculuses or um, one of those other nasties. So they don't really guard it so much as long as they keep the doors closed. Not much is gonna get in, except maybe this Riggin or pirates who want to fuck with other pirates or whatever. Um, and they also hang wanted posters on the inside of the wall <laughs> and other. It's used for like messages and whatnot, which I think is kind of fun. That this sort of graffitied palisade wall on the inside um let's see uh da, 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 da. talking about the um the, the uh meat of dogs in more detail do you have the picture of the five of them i do yeah so i love these 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 characters i i know i use these guys in my own uh scarred lands campaign on occasion um they're just such and, and this this artwork um shows up a lot um, in uh, it's, it's in the um, story, the story scene vault is one of the you can just grab it and throw it in your book artwork, so it it gets used a lot in in the lore books, um, and this is the this is the meat of dogs as they currently stand. Um, you've got Captain Frist Deadlights Lear, who's the um, uh, orc looking fellow with the knife in the table. Um, he's chaotic evil. He's um, all, all, uh, all, uh, and all kind of all bark no bite um, as well. <laughs> um, he rules by fear, not necessarily by actual prowess. Um, and he also, but he brews draughts made of blood, tainted water to give him strength. So we'll see how long before he gets cancer or something, um, <laughs> or whatever their equivalent is. Um, there's Captain Silas Trask. Who's the fellow in the bottom with the with the glorious braids? Um, he's a older gentleman, chaotic neutral, um, former baron, um, who left left the court for adventure on the high seas. So, picture your classic, I'm out for the adventure of it kind of a chap. Um, um, and he's usually the one of the five who has the most common sense <laughs> and talks the other four into not doing something stupid, <laughs> like doing a full-on invasion of Riggin. <laughs> um, um, there's Bebel, Mistress of Squalls. Um, she's the lady with the phenomenally awesome dreadlocks um, and the eyebrow piercing. <laughs> Which, you know, this is 2002, so eyebrow piercings weren't nearly as popular back then. Um, <laughs> but this image is what started the trend, so... Yes, I am all over to that. Go later, right? <laughs> Um, she's a, a sorceress um, and a chaotic neutral as well. Um, she, but she's not a very high-level character. She's a sorceress, yes. She can cast some cantrips, <laughs> but she fools everybody into thinking she's more powerful than she is by having some very powerful magic items. Um, as she has, um, according to the lore here, an orb of storms, which is probably from some three-five DMG or something, and a horn of fog. So. That's a great way to make yourself look intimidating. Um, but her big thing is being worried that people will learn the truth that she's not really as badass as she is. A little spoilers here. Um, and she would send adventurers to find her more powerful magic items to, to um, uh, get her power a little more stable. <laughs> or maybe a spell book or two, but she's not that smart. She's not a wizard, she's a sorceress. And then we have Uktog. Uh, the big gentleman 
in the middle with the nipple piercings, because <laughs> we're all about piercings. Also Usually something Scarlet that is... this picture probably made popular. Yeah, yeah. Scarlet <laughs> is normally about the tattoos, and I was just amazed by the amount of piercings in this. In this yeah. Um, in fact, um, I don't see any tattoos in this picture. No, I'm disappointed. There are no tattoos. It's all, 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 um, all piercings. Um, anyway, uh, Uk Tog is a uh, scrag. Um, so you know, she is a playable race in the 5th edition. Um, a blood sea mutant scrag, no less. And he represents Queen Right. Well, he represents the underwater denizens. So Bloodport also has dealings with the merfolk and whoever lives underwater in the region. Um, this is, you can't not. He doesn't represent Queen Ran. He doesn't represent the Piscians. He doesn't represent the good guys either, because he's neutral evil. <laughs> so he's not representing the, the poor merfolk who are enslaved. No. He kind of represents all of them and periodically pits them against each other in a very, very dangerous political machinations. Um, uh, so in his attempts to keep Bloodport as neutral as possible. Because we can't side with one or the other because that would cause all sorts of chaos, you know. But if all we should probably side with Creed Rand since she is more of the territory in this region. But we don't want to piss off the Piscians because we don't want them screwing with our ships. So he plays a really difficult game um, and possibly doomed to fail. Um, and he got his position... Um, by slewing the marrow, which is a run of the race, not marrow as in blown marrow, but marrow as in M E R R O, um, who was Queen Rand's representative. So, add that to the to the politics of his position. Tenuous at best, I would say. It's good that he can regenerate. <laughs> True. <laughs> and then finally, we have we have the beautiful one who I consider love quite lovely, our non-binary uh, individual Ness Orin. Chaotic ne neutral half elf, um, who in the classic lore, back in 2002, was a crossdresser who wore female clothing, um, assigned male at birth. Uh, today's lore, I would think they would just go by they. <laughs> and they're a devoted follower of Inkili, and basically Inkili number one, Bloodport number two. <laughs> um, and everything they do is pretty much in Inkili's name. Um, but they're a badass and a, a high pretty high-level cleric of Achilles. So, um, and and uh, glorious um, uh, fashionista, I would say. Um, and I uh, kind of love that character, and also chaotic neutral. So, which as as would be a cleric of Achilles. So that's um, that's the sea dogs. And they sort of enforce the laws of Bloodport and make the decisions that need to be made. Bloodport's laws are interesting. Um, you would think, you know, it's, it's a city of pirates, so you'd think it would be lawless, and it's not lawless. Um, it's definitely law legally. <laughs> there really isn't any kind of social, um, social support or network or anything like that. You're not going to come to Bloodport for its healthcare program. Um, <laughs> you're lucky a cleric of Keely might help you. Um, or go to Haven, um, but they're not, they're just monks. Uh, but they do have laws, um, uh, particularly around specifically theft. Um, so punishment for murder, which you think would be bad, was like, hmm, well, who'd you kill? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you killed the sea captain. Okay, okay, you're gonna get, you're gonna get a lashing. Pretty bad one. You killed some nameless drunk? Whatever. Oh, I, I guess we maybe, yeah getting in a little bit of trouble. They don't have a prison or anything. It's not like, you know, or any way to indenture you or anything like that. So it's like, yeah, we'll just beat you. Um, commit sexual assault. Yeah, it's, it'll beat you a little bit more. <laughs> but not, you know, we don't have anywhere where to punish you. Um, but if you steal something, that's a big fucking deal. Because <laughs> this is all about, this is a merchant port. We can't get a bad reputation that we rob people here. If you're a kid and you steal something, yeah, we'll just smack you around a little bit. That's okay, you're a kid, whatever. You probably work for the South Dock guy. And, yeah. But if you're an adult and you steal something, you lose, you lose a body part. 
And if you steal something really important, you lose your life. <laughs> and if you wreck a ship, steal something important, they hang you. You wreck a ship, you burn a ship, or you destroy a ship. It's the worst. That is the worst. That is the capital punishment of capital punishment. And they kill you very slowly. And as they kill you through exposure over the course of a long time, and it's very nasty and yuck. So, and that's their that's their laws. So, you don't want to rob over the age of eighteen, and you certainly don't want to rob anybody powerful. <laughs> so, um, let's sell all the pirates with the with the hook hands. They probably stole something they shouldn't have, <laughs> not because their hand was actually bitten off by a mutant shark. Uh, so, there you go. Um, of import, uh. All the gods are followed of, of, of faith, um, important faith. Uh, all the gods are followed in Bloodport, um, the divine gods. Um, Titan worship is a no-no, although not super enforced. Um, but the big thing is the big three, which, you know, some areas, the like, big three are like Corian and Madriel, not here. Benawi, goddess of the sea, no-brainer. And Keeley, goddess of, of pirates and Catech neutralness and storms and all of that makes sense. And Belsimuth, which surprised me a little bit. So I was like, and Belsimuth? Okay. She's not really known for pirates. She's known for assassins and lycanthropes. Not so much the Blood Sea, but she's the third of the big three gods. Goddess of the Moon. Considered a death goddess. Um, so a lot of undead, but she's not, she's not as associated with undead so much. So I don't, was like, well, Belsmith, that's interesting. I mean, the moon affects the tides? I think it has to do with Katam. And because, ripping his heart out? Yeah. I think it's the <laughs> anti Katam thing. And it's yeah. Belsmith's way of kind of keeping an eye on him. So she has a lot of influence in Bloodport. Um, and then you've also got this other organization that's very against Belsmith in the same region. You know, Dead Moon's a hop, skip, and a jump from Bloodport. Not even a hop, skip, and a jump, just a hop and a jump. Um, so you've already got, you know, a hate on for Bellsmith so so close by. So I think that's why, because, you know, yes, the moon and the tides, that maps too, but there's two moons, you know. Not that the other moon has a god, because it doesn't, but there, there you go. So the big three. And um, they say that um, there's temples to all of there, there's no temples. There's shrines to all of the gods. So if you want to go pray to Madriel, you can go find a Madriel shrine, no problem. Or Vangel, even, you know, whoever. But there's big shrines to these three. And um, the first thing you do when you get into port, to go to a tavern, you buy three rounds, one for each of the those three gods. And the last thing you do before you leave port is swing by their shrine and give offerings to those three gods. And that's kind of the tradition in blood port. You better do those things. Um, so there you go. And and the and the followings and the offerings are a little different too, varying by the gods. So it's like, you know, Keely, you have to like give a stolen thing, which is interesting because again, theft is illegal. So you know, how did you do that one? Um, probably from your pirate robbery, not because you stole it on blood on Bloodport. You know, and um, Manawi would be like, "Oh, I have found a beautiful seashell for you." And Bellsmith's like, "I bled for you here." You know, <laughs> like have the heart of my enemy, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> so give these little offerings, um, and uh, that's that's fun. <laughs> so laws, faiths. Um, Open conditions. I kind of covered that. Uh, I think that's the bulk of it. Um, so before we leave the the lush aisle, um, there's a comment in chat. Oh. It was a question in chat, but it's a it's a really good question that brings up more issues with you know. Um, can't think of the word right now. Mutations? <laughs> no. Um, consistency. Oh, consistency. Consistency oh, yeah. throughout the, the lore. So there's a oh. part that's left out of the, um, the Blood Sea book that the Lush Isle was actually originally inhabited by the Frost Apes. I'm assuming they yeah. probably had a different name then. Um, their actual entry doesn't say what they were called before they were banished to Fenrelic, but they used to inhabit the, the Lush Isle, and they were very uh, protective of it, but they never killed anyone. They just beat you unconscious, take you back out, and leave you. 
And when the Divine War started, I think it's Chardoon. Let me double check that. Yep, Chardoon was like, hey, you guys are super good fighters. Although he didn't really realize that they weren't killers. And so he was like, scoop, and brought them over and dumped them and was like, okay, go fight for me. And they did, but they were like, uh, okay, we'll beat these guys unconscious. And then they'd wake up and start fighting again. So Chardoon was like, you're useless. Blip, and banished them all to Fenrilay. And in that time, the Pirates of Bloodport were like, well, the Frost Apes are gone. We're going to take over this island now. All of that is left out of the Blood Sea book. Now, yeah, whether that was a consistency error or they just didn't have room for it and it was already part well, of an older book. Blood Sea book it... came out before the Fenrilay book. Right, oh, right, but as far as, so the, the original Frost Ape entry was in the Creature Collection. It was in the Creature Collection. Yeah, and so why did they leave it out, that bit of history out of the Blood Sea book? Without asking the original people, um, no uh, idea. Um, I have but... access to some of them, but they don't remember shit, so. <laughs> right. <laughs> it was like guess. 20 years ago, I don't know. <laughs> If, if so I can were... ask it, but they're not going to answer. Because um, I have asked them, uh, not quite on that level, but I've asked them like, even bigger questions. And they're like, right. I don't remember. I don't know. Which is if usually were... the line. I... I if I were to come up with an answer, I would say, you know, um, it's already part of another book. So did they need to restate it? No. They and they do probably make... forgot. <laughs> they, they do make a thing of not, um, with the um, exceptions of the gazetteers, um, they don't generally restate things. In these books i will say that and i didn't look in the fenrilic book for um the thing and i didn't do i didn't spend a lot of time in the creature collection because honestly i just didn't have time um and, and to be fair uh, like the person who asked the question was alone and he Alon, did the he's, conversion he's for the frost apes of a nerd Fenrilic, as I am, so and, he, and he did the conversion for the he frost knew apes. <laughs> <laughs> good question thanks for doing uh, that for that no and idea hopefully um, that answered like i don't think there's a solid answer i think it's more I don't know. Yeah, a solid answer is to is to <laughs> is to go back in time, <laughs> in the mind of of the folks who wrote this. Not all, right. but all of them are still with us, um, and see if Joe remembered. Um, I I I I am in contact with Joe Karkar, but he's he's loath to tell me things. He's re reticent. To, I just say reticent to tell me things, and also his memory is like fuck. I don't know. <laughs> so. It was 20 years ago, I don't know. Because we had 70 writers and wrote 45 books in four years. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Which is generally the response I get when I ask him a really, really, it's, it's I feel, but I, I don't generally ask him questions like that because it's just cruel. Um, but, uh, but there you go. There you go. So, um, yeah. Um, oh, there was one other. Uh, there was one other thing in my notes that I, I skipped um, about the volcano and Riggin. Mm. Um, there's this loony guy called. Uh, this is a fun little tool for a GM. Volca, Volcache, Volcache. Oh no, no, no. That's what they call the island. Sorry, my bad. The Riggin call the volcano Volcache, the angry sleeper. Um, the um, pirates call it Old Old King Smolder stopped violently erupting, but it still smokes and every once in a while belches out something unpleasant. Um, there's this human sorcerer called Farlease. F-A-R-L-E-S-E. -E, who claims to be a member of the Brotherhood of the Flame. Which is a bunch of crazy cultists. Um, and he uses volcanic rocks from Lush Island as spell components. But he's a kind of a coward. And he doesn't want to deal with the carnivorous plants. So he'll send adventurers out going, find me volcanic rocks and I will pay you money. So there's this little plot hook. But um, people suspect he's a follower of Thulkas. And as much as you can get away with shit in Bloodport, worshipping a titan, not so much. Although, you know, there are Cadam followers in around the area, so it's not really well enforced. Um, but they don't really want to worship us at Thulkas around here because... It's not considered good. Um, and uh, But the uh, natives of Riggin have this pool in the middle of the island, which um, is this... In the middle of this pool, there's this big spire of volcanic rock. 
that they claim was thrown there when Old Smokey um, erupted and landed there. And they're like, it is sacred. It is the only piece of the sacred volcano that we have on our shitty island over here. And so they were like, no, this is holy. And but uh, I'm sure that Farley's would really like to get his hands on it. <laughs> so Adventure Hook continues onto the other island and go messing with the basically Polynesian natives um, who really want nothing to do with anything. Colonialism undercurrents are fucked up, really, so they are. Um, um, <laughs> but they're there, and yeah. Um, we do try to not be so exploitive in this, but it, it is based on combining it with actual history. Uh, influenced by, I should say, influenced by real world history, because these kind of settings always are. So there you go. Um, so there's that little, little kind of fun plot hook. Um, skimming through my notes to see if there's anything else that was interesting. I think that's the bulk of it. Um, anything else you wanted to add, boss? No. <laughs> uh, I covered a lot, so. So yeah, that's the Blood Sea. Um, there is more, as I said. Uh, the 5e Blood Sea book, Crimson Abyss, is available on drive through um, Mostly talks about the pirates and how to play a character. Um, and the uh, big old 3-5 book is also available on drive through in, in that. And that's deeper lore, um, less in the rules front and more just on just the awesomeness. And Queen Ran and her full description and absolute craziness is found in The Wise and the Wicked, um, both old and new. Um, they have her listed as a CR 25. She's a 20th level spellcaster. She has lair actions and legendary actions that are insane. And she's a kraken with a strength of 30. I think CR 25 is lowballing it. <laughs> I really do. But she's better than how they had her in the old book. In the old book, they actually had her CR 20, and I was like, what? <laughs> she's already a Kraken, which is like a CR 15, and then they threw 20 levels of spellcast around top of her. No, I did. I disagreed. Um, but um, and even now, I, I'm, I, my, I haven't done the math, and I'm, as Alan will tell you, I, 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 I hate doing the math on CR calculations. Um, <laughs> As uh, so, Jeremy Crawford was in, uh, interviewed by the guy from Sly Flourish. I can't think of his name right now. Sorry. Um, and they were talking about this, like the the CR system and everything. And really, the CR system was built in reverse. Like they reverse engineered it after they wrote the books. So it's kind of a cluster. It's a good guide, but it doesn't like a lot of the stuff in the books don't follow it. So you just kind of have to go with it as you see fit. <laughs> I joke that it's as much of an art as it is science for yeah. a reason. I've, I've got spreadsheets. They don't make any sense. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> you know, and uh, do you round up? Do you round down? I, oh, it's, it's a mess. Yeah. Um, and uh, sometimes you run up, sometimes you run down. In the end, you go with your gut. My gut tells me Queen Ran is higher than a CR25. Um, my gut tells me you do not fight Queen Ran unless you're a god. <laughs> That's what my gut tells or, me. or if you have the help of a god. I mean, like. Or if you have the help of a god. Yeah, yeah. Right. Queen Ran is an NPC who comes and smacks your ass and says, go find me Catam's heart. Yeah, she's definitely um, more of a, a plot hook than yeah. you need to go fight her. Yeah, you do not fight Queen Ran any more than you fight Bellsmith. So, Travis, if you're um, watching, I'm totally expecting us to have to go fight Queen Ran, Queen Ran. on a family affair <laughs> when family we come back yeah, in when May. when we reach level 20, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, like, because, holy shit, I calculated it. She does 150 points of damage around, <laughs> or nice. at least, at least, and that's just without me looking at her spells. That's without throwing a, you know circle of death or a disintegrate in the pile or, or or any of those and she gets more spell slots than you're supposed to get so <laughs> she's broken 
<laughs> so yeah. Oh, and they gave her shield too, which is just stupid. <laughs> Here's his CR AC of twenty. Oh, let's let's have her cast shield too. Okay. Anyway, that's Queen. I love I love her. I and I have definitely used her many times. Um, she's just too awesome not to not to fuck up with the party. <laughs> And then it's, it's like last time I did run, she's like, okay, go, go, go fetch me Countum's heart. And they're like, sure. Just run down go to the 7 Eleven and pick one of those up. <laughs> Do that for you, ma'am. Yeah. And if you're interested in playing um, at the Triton, um, let's see what else, oh, yeah. the Scrag, check out the uh, Collected Yugman's Guide to Gelsbad. They are introduced as a uh, playable race. Um, there are freshwater titan, which are not fucked up by the blood sea, but then there's the, the blood titan titans so, or uh, tritons. So if you do want to play one that has like an extra arm or something like that, <laughs> absolutely. Um, yeah, and, yeah, and as Travis points tritons, out, the fresh freshwater tritons could be in that little zone in the blood sea that's pure yeah, by the absolutely. seawall. So there's a little area that you could find them. Um, but right now, as you're dealing with the blood blood tainted in the blood sea so yeah, there's tons 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 and tons here okay so i think that's, nice. I think that's it for me uh, awesome for this week I'm... why don't you give us all your details uh, my name is sarah stewart i pretend i know things about the scarred lands mostly because i just read the books over and over again i also wrote a novel set in place in the scarred lands called vigilant through shadows of dreams but one as well as a whole mess of publications on drive through um including frostlands of fenrelic mists of algos um and uh, various and other sprinkly titles. Um, so you can find all of those and more out on my website, um, or links to all of those and more on my website at morelikethisindustries.com. Nice. And I am Jeremy Holcalter. You can find me on Twitter at WHPubs, here on Twitch at WH Publications, same as on Facebook. Uh, and if you're interested in playing the Shark Folk, there's a non-canon um, version in the Scarred Races book, uh, player option guide for the Scarred Lands over on Drive Through. I just put the link for that up. I also put I'll put all of Sarah's links and my links in the show notes if you're catching this on YouTube or on podcast later. I think that's pretty much it. Um, join us on Mondays for Travis Legs show. We're actually taking a break from our Scarland stuff, but for April we'll be doing some of the jump starts that are published by Onyx Path this Friday. Or sorry, this Monday we're doing um, vampire. vampire. Yeah, Vampire the yeah, Requiem. I will, I will not be able to join for those, but my wife Fran will be, as far as I know, will be participating unless nice. something unexpected comes up, awesome. which things do. Um, it's and, true. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it is true. So I hope to be rejoining the family affair when that comes back, but I'm not going to be able to participate in the uh, the jump starts. Oh, yes. Yeah. But and go. then join us next week on the Lore You Know. Same bat time, same bat channel. And Unknown we'll... topic. <laughs> right. <laughs> and we'll see you then. All right. Bye, everybody. Bye.